السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله على إحسانه والشكر له على تفضله وامتنانه ولا إله إلا الله تعظيما لشأنه وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله داعي إلى رضوانه وعلى آله وأصحابه وإخوانه أما بعد إخواني في الله We continue with our lecture series regarding some of the greats of Islamic history. One of the greatest people in our history is a man known as the fifth Khalifa or the fifth righteously guided Khalifa of the Muslims. A man known as Umar ibn Abdul Aziz ibn Marwan ibn Al Hakam ibn Al As ibn Umayya ibn Abd Al Shams ibn Abd Manaf, all the way to Adnan, the son of Ismail alayhi salam. This is this is his name. So what is the story of this man, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, that he was raised to this status that is known as the fifth righteously, righteously guided Khalifa? As you know, the best four Khalifas are in order. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali. Number five, when they mention the righteously guided Khulafa, they mention this man, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. So what is the story of this man? Go back to history, Khanifillah. The second leader of the Muslims, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar ibn al-Khattab, the Prophet alayhi salatu salam used to say, if there's anyone who will become a prophet after me, it is this man, Umar ibn al-Khattab. But I am the finality of prophets. There's no other person who will be prophet after me. So Umar ibn al-Khattab had a lot of excellent attributes. One day he was sleeping, Qaylula, the siesta between, before, before Dhuhr. He wakes up and he says, من هذا الأشج الذي سيملا أرض عدلا بعد أن مليت ظلما وجورا؟ Who is this scared one from my family who will fill this earth with justice after it was filled with oppression and ظلما? Who is this scared one from my family? So the entire family of Umar bin Khattab they used to know amongst themselves there is someone who is going to be a leader from amongst them who will fill the earth with justice, who will become a righteous Khalifa. This is something the family of Umar al-Khattab was expecting. Umar al-Khattab, who every night is the Khalifa, Allah, Allah has given him a big responsibility. He knows he's in charge of the orphans, the widows, the fuqara. So every night he patrols the city of Medina. So he goes patrolling the city of Medina with his uh, servant al-Aslam. So one day he's very tired, rahimahullah, wa radiyallahu anhu, amir al muminin So he puts his hand next to a house to rest. As he's resting next to that house, he hears a conversation between two women. One woman says, oh my daughter, go take the milk, mix it with water, with water so that we can sell more tomorrow. Mix the milk with water, we can sell more tomorrow. The daughter says, ya ummah, ama alimti anna amir al muminin don't you know that the leader of the believers, Umar al Khattab, has forbade us to mix water with milk? Says, Oh, my daughter, what are you talking about, Umar? Umar is in the palace, he's doing his things. How will he know about this? Says, Subhanallah, I will not be the type to obey Umar in public and disobey him in private. These are the words she said. Umar al Khattab was so impressed with this lady, he made sure that the servant marks the house. The next day he sends the servant, go do a lot of research on that family. So the, he comes, he does research and finds out that these two women, a mother and a daughter, they don't have any other men in the house. She's not married this young girl and they have no other men. Umar al Khattab says this is an opportunity. So he calls all his sons, Abdullah ibn Umar, Asim and the rest, he calls them for a gathering. He says, oh my children, I am your father. I have no need for women anymore. But if I was in need of a woman, the first woman from the city of Medina I'll be marrying is this woman. Who amongst you wants a wife? Abdullah, do you want a wife? No, I already have a wife. So and so, do you want a wife? No, I already have a wife. Asim, radiallahu anhu, says, Oh my father, marry me to her because I do not have a wife. So this lady who, who refused to mix the milk with the water got married to Asim. And from this marriage came a daughter called Layla. This Layla was married to the father of Umar ibn Aziz, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. So Abdul Aziz ibn Marwan. Abdul Aziz ibn Marwan married this girl, Layla. And from that marriage came our person we're talking about today, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the righteous Khalifa of the Muslims. So the Muslims are waiting. The family of Khattab is waiting for who is the, he's going to be al ashaj Bani ibn Khattab. Who is this going to be the scarred one from our family? So they think 
that one of the sons of Abdullah ibn Umar, a man called Bilal ibn Abdullah ibn Umar, will be the person mentioned by Umar in that, in that dream or in that prophet that he received from Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Perhaps it's him, but it's not him. Then Umar al Aziz radiallahu anhu wa rahimahullah was born in the year 61 of Hijri calendar. His father, Abdul Aziz ibn Marwan ibn al Hakam. Abdul Aziz ibn Marwan ibn al Hakam, if you know anything about Islamic history, Marwan ibn al Hakam was a Khalifa of the Muslims. So his father was the son of the Khalifa. He was one of the options or one of the people that was set up to be a future Khalifa. But his brother Abdul Malik became the Khalifa. So Abdul Malik became the Khalifa of Muslims, and this Abdul Aziz became the governor of Egypt. As is the governor of Egypt, him and Layla, the, great, the granddaughter of Umar, they get this son called Umar. They get a son called Umar in Egypt. So this Umar lives with the father for a while. Then one day, as he's enjoying the ship, not the ship, the horses of the, of the governor of Egypt, one of the horses kicks Umar in the face. And he gets a big cut on his face. And he falls down, almost unconscious, bleeding. The father comes and tells him, In kunta anta ashadju bani umayya fa'innaka lasa'id. If you are the scarred one from the family of Bani Umayya, the one Umar was talking about, then indeed you are a happy man. So he decided to send his son from Egypt, go to Medina, study under the scholars of Medina, the great scholars, the fuqaha sab'a in Medina. So he went to Medina and he studied under the Sahaba Anas ibn Malik. Anas ibn Malik, rahimahu, radiallahu anhu, he says, I was a servant of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for 10 years. Wallahi, I've never seen anyone ashbah bi salat in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam min hadha al-ghulam. I've not seen a man whose prayer looks close, resembles the prayer of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam like this young man, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Such was the praise he's getting from the Sahaba, the likes of Anas ibn Malik, who was the servant of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for 10 years. He studies in Medina under the scholars of Medina. He studies under a man called Ubaidillah ibn Abdullah ibn Utba ibn Mas'ud, one of the seven great scholars of Medina. Medina has seven great scholars, Sa'id ibn Musayyib, Urwa ibn Zubair, and this man and others, Kharij and so on and so forth. So he studied as under him. Then his father decides, I want my son to have an Islamic upbringing. He's too spoiled. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, when he used to walk Medina, Everyone in Medina will know, ha, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz passed through this way because of the excellent perfume he used to wear. He used to wear the most expensive perfume. He used to be given a cloth by his tailor that is made out of 400, that cost 400 dirham, 400 silver coins, and he says, ah, it's still too rough. He wants the most expensive, most luxurious clothes that money can buy. Eats the best food, drinks the best of drinks, wears the best of clothes, he wears the best of perfumes. His perfumes were so excellent, that people used to go bribe the maid who was washing the clothes, wash our clothes with the clothes of Umar, so that we can get that excellent smell on our clothes. Such was this young boy. So his father, Abdul Aziz ibn Marwan, was concerned. So he wants this boy to grow up as a righteous man. So he sends, he asks one of the scholars of Medina, one of the greats of the Tabi'een, Salih ibn Kaysan, Discipline my child. Make sure that he has al-akhlaq al-islamiyya, al-tarbiya al-islamiyya. So Salim al-Kaysan starts bringing this boy up. And he says, Wallahi, ma ra'aytu ahadan, Allahu a'adhama fi aynihi min Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. I've never seen anyone who loves Allah, who holds Allah in great respect like this young boy, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. I've met Sa'id ibn Musayib, I've met of the Sahabas, I've met so many greats, but I've not seen anyone who fears Allah more than this boy. But this boy is still living a life of luxury. He's a leader, he's a royal family. So in Medina one day, he comes late to the mosque of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Salim Kaysan is not impressed. He says, why are you late for salah? It was not the way of the Muslims to be late for salah. It was something strange. So he asks, why are you late for salah? He says, the hairdresser who was brushing my hair was the one who delayed me. He says, you got delayed because you are making your hair for salah. Okay. So he writes a letter to the father in Egypt. Salim Kisan writes a letter. He says, your son, he missed prayer. He got late to salah in the prophet's mosque because of his hair. When the father got this letter, he was so angry. He sent a servant, go to Medina. Do not speak to anyone and do what I've commanded you. So this servant comes all the way from Egypt. 
He does not speak to anyone. Ah, where is Umar? Umar is there. He comes and he shaves off the hair. Says, your father said, this is the hair that has made you delayed for salah. Next time you delay salah, you shall be beaten thoroughly. Don't think you're from royal family. So he grew up, in this state. Born in the year 61 of the Hijri calendar. In the year 86 or so, the Khalifa of the Muslims at the time, the first Khalifa from this lineage was Marwan ibn al-Hakam. Marwan ibn al-Hakam died, then Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. Then after Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, his son, Al-Walid, became the Khalifa, Al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik. So Al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik, in the year 86 of the Hijri calendar, he sends Umar to Medina. When he's only 25, born in the year 61, the year 86, is only 25 years of age, he says, go to be the governor of Medina. So he goes to Medina, and he gathers all the scholars of Medina. And he says, oh dear scholars, and this is the time, Muhammad, we had the greatest scholars in Islam. At the time in Medina, the seven great scholars were in Medina. So he gathers all the scholars, he tells them, anything that you command me, I will follow. I'm here to listen to the ulama. Anything you see wrong, please tell me and correct me. I'm here to listen to you, you are my scholars. And he takes one of the scholars of Medina, Abu Bakr ibn Abi Hazim, and he makes him the chief judge of the city of Medina. So he starts his life in Medina. And he governs them the best of governorships. But in Iraq, if you're aware of history, there's a pastor called Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al thaqafi the governor of, of Iraq. This is the man who killed Abdullah ibn Zubair. He killed many of the Sahaba of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was an oppressor to the people of Iraq. Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al thaqafi the governor of Iraq. So people are running away from Iraq and they come to the city of Medina seeking refuge with this just leader, the Imam. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. So, of course, the judge was not impressed. He writes complaints about Umar to the Khalifa. Umar writes complaints about Al Hajjaj to the Khalifa. He says, Hajjaj wants to come to Hajj. He says, Oh, Walid, oh, Khalifa, I beseech you, this Hajjaj should not step into the city of Medina. Let him perform his Hajj in Mecca and go back to Iraq. Let him go back to Kufa and wherever he wants to go to. Let him not step to Iraq. So, Hajjaj hated. Uh, he didn't like Umar ibn Aziz. So he writes a letter, a letter to the Khalifa. He says, I've done this and this for you. All the rebels that were threatening your rule in, in, in the Khalifa, I've removed all of them. But this Umar ibn Aziz is giving them refuge and is making my work difficult. Please change him to someone else. So Al-Walid decides to remove Umar ibn Abdul Aziz after he ruled the governorship of Medina for seven years in the year 92 or 93 of the Hijri calendar when he was about 32 years of age. So he goes back to Syria. He stays there in Syria in a place called Suwaida. So he stays in Suwaida for a while. Then the Khalifa dies. His brother Suleiman ibn Abdul Malik becomes the Khalifa. Suleiman ibn Abdul Malik, the first thing he does, Hajjaj has already passed away. Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi, that evil leader of Iraq has already passed away. So the very first thing he does, Suleiman Abdul Malik, he removes all the governors who were appointed by Hajjaj. All the oppressors, we do not want any oppression in our, in our, in our, in our state, Islamic state and Islamic empire. Number two, he made sure that Salah was prayed upon time. The Khalifas before him were delaying Salah. The Khalifas those days, they are the Imams of the mosques. The Imam who is leading Salah is also the Khalifa of the Muslims. But they used to delay the Salah a lot. So he removes all these practices and he takes from his advisors, from his ministers, his beloved cousin, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, radiallahu an. Then, one day, Suleiman ibn Abdul Malik, the Khalifa of the Muslims, he looks in the mirror and he's impressed by himself. And he says, Ana Malik al -shab. I am the young king. I am the leader of the superpower, the most powerful empire on earth. Subhanallah, perhaps he gave himself an evil eye. For after a few days, he fell very sick and he knew that death is coming upon him. He was very young at that time. So he says to his other minister, Raja ibn Haywata, he says, who should I appoint as the Khalifa after me? Who will be the leader of this vast Islamic empire after me? Can I put my sons? He says, your sons are not able to take care of themselves. They're too young. How will they take care of the Islamic empire? says, let me appoint my brothers then. I Yazid, I have Hisham. Let me appoint my brothers. He says, no. Think of someone else. So after a while, Sunu al Maliki says, Wallahi, I'm going to choose someone. And Shaitan will have no part in this decision. 
I choose Umar ibn Abdul Aziz to be the Khalifa of the Muslims after me. The scholars, they say, from the greatest deeds of this man, Sulaiman Abdul Malik, it is sufficient for him those two deeds. He brought back the Salah to be prayed upon its time, and he gave Umar ibn Abd Aziz the rulership of the Muslims after his death. So he passed away in the year 99 of the Hijra calendar. But before he passed away, there's a challenge. He says to Raja, Oh Raja, my brothers and my family, my side of the family, they will not accept my decision. I to give my cousin and overlook my brothers, they will see this decision as very difficult and probably have unrest in the country. Maybe there will be a civil war. There shall be tension in this place. So he says, let me do this. I'll appoint Umar ibn Abdul Aziz and I'll appoint after him Yazid ibn Abdul Malik and Hisham ibn Abdul Malik after him. So I'll appoint three people to be the leaders after me. This is my letter. I'm signing it. Call all the royal family. So all the nobles are gathered by Raja ibn Haywata. They, he says to them, Raja, the Khalifa is here besides you. He's about to die. It is his last breath. This is the letter he has chosen the future leader of the Muslims. Give your allegiance to the person written to this letter. Ah, we do not know who is in this letter. Are you judging the judgment of the Khalifa before he even dies? Are you going to dis disrespect him in his own home? Give allegiance to the person written in this letter. So all of them, they come, they give allegiance to the person written in that letter and they do not know who it is. He says to them, all of you have pledged allegiance to the one in this letter. You have agreed to follow him and to obey him. He says, yes. And if you disobey him, our neck, we shall be executed. This is agreed upon all of us. Suleiman ibn Abdul Malik dies. Raja ibn Haywata opens the letter in front of the Umayyads. All of them are gathering. He says, Hada min Amir al -Muminin. This is from the Amir al -Muminin. And he has decided the Khalifa after him is Umar ibn Abdul Aziz ibn Marwan ibn al Hakam. And after him, Al Yazid ibn Abdul Malik. And after him, Hisham ibn Abdul Malik. Hisham ibn Abdul Malik says, No, how can it be? He's not from our family line. We cannot accept this decision. It is either I or Yazid to be the next leader. Raja ibn Haywata says, Soldier, the soldier is there. You want to be executed, young man? He's threatening one of the royal family. He says, No, I've accepted. All of them give pledges to Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz does not want this. He never wished to be a leader. And this fills his heart with a lot of sadness and anguish. So he goes to the Grand Mosque of the, of the Bani Umayyah and he says to the Muslims, I have been chosen as the new leader of the believers. I resign immediately. You have not chosen me. So make your choice whoever you, have, you want. The Muslims, all of them in the mosque, they shouted, we want only Umar ibn Abdul Aziz to be the leader of the Muslims. We want only Umar ibn Abdul Aziz to be the Khalifa of the Muslims. No one else. And they gave him allegiance. And he accepted it with, 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 uh, with, not with that firmness. Thereafter, Khanifillah, he goes home and he tells his wife, oh my dear wife, his wife, just for benefit, Fatima binti Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. How his wife... Is the, is the wife of the Khalifa. For he is the Khalifa. The wife, Fatima, is the daughter of Abdul Malik, who was a Khalifa. The wife is the granddaughter of Marwan ibn Hakam, who was also a Khalifa. Her four brothers, Al Walid, Sulaiman, Yazid, Hisham, all of them were Khalifa. This is a lady that you cannot find an example of in the entire history of human beings, where her entire family were Khalifa. Her brothers, her father, her grandfather, Khalifa. So she goes to this woman who is the most royal of royal you can get in, in, our, in entire history and says to her, oh my wife, I give you two options. Option number one, you give out all this jewelry that you were given by your father to the Muslim treasury. It does not belong to us. All this jewelry I do not want to see in my house. That's option number one. Option number two, go live your life as you please. You will no longer be my wife. Choose whichever you want. So the lady says, Wallahi, I do not choose anyone to be my husband in this world and in the day after except you, Umar. All this jewelry, I give it out to the Baytul Mal. Umar himself, all the money, all the wealth he was given by his father-in-law, the former Khalifa Abdul Malik, he gives it to the Baytul Mal. He started with his own self. Then he goes to his relatives, his family, the, the governors, the ministers, the royal family of the Umayyads. And he tells them, all of you have taken money and property from people unjustly. And you know the wrongs that you have done. 
all of you, I'm taking all your money and all that thing that does not belong to you. I'm only leaving what is sufficient for you. Of course, the family were not happy with this. They were all angry with him. How dare him reduce us from that level of luxury to a level where we're like the common people. We are the royal family. So he takes everything from them. Thereafter, Hanifillah, he says to the Muslims, any Muslim who has been wronged by any of these brothers and cousins of mine has a right to come to my house and report them. And I'll give them on top of that 300 dinar money to compensate them for their journey. So people started bringing complaints. Thereafter, Hanifillah, the bodyguards now, the presidential escort, they come. They tell him, ha, we have your presidential motorcade or the carriages at the time. All these horses are for the Khalifa. He says, all this, I don't need. I'm sufficient with a donkey. Give me one of the donkeys that I was using before. That is sufficient for me. He says, come live in the palace. The royal family says, no. I have my house. In fact, even that house is too luxurious. A small home is enough for me and my family. And he goes and he lives in a house made of mud. If you look at the architecture of those times, look at the Grand Mosque of the Bani Umayyad, look at the Masjid Al-Aqsa, the Quba Sakhra, the dome, the golden dome. Mosques and architecture was a very high standard of the Muslims at that time. But this man does not choose that. He chooses a mud house, a place made of mud. Then he started his journey from the year 99 of the Hijri calendar. And he started spreading justice. So much so, that zakah, they will not get people to give zakah. There was not one single person from the people of the Islamic empire that had, was poor. People are given money, zakah, come take zakah, no one comes take it. The, he's, uh, he's in charge in Iraq, sends him a letter, he says, oh, Amir al-Mu'minin, the treasury is full. We have collected a lot of zakah. He says, give to the poor people. He says, I've given all the poor people. He says, look for the young men who have not married. Give them what is required for the marriage expenses. He gives them. He says, there's still a lot of money. He says, look for the people who have debts. Pay their debts off. He says, I've done so. There's still a lot of money. He says, the ones who want to go for Hajj and Umrah, pay for them. He says, I've done so. There's still a lot of money. A lot of money. So much so that the Imam Sa'id ibn Musayib was asked, Man al Mahdi? Who is the Mahdi? Who is that man who the Prophet ﷺ prophesied will come at the time of Dajjal and spread justice upon the earth and so much wealth will be there? He used to say, Sa'id ibn Musayib, the Mahdi is Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Rahimahullah. So this man also, he calls the scholars from Medina. Amongst them, the great scholar Muhammad ibn Shihab. Muhammad ibn Muslim al-Zuhri, rahimahullah, who passed away in the year 125 of the Hijri calendar. He says, O oh, Imam, the Quran of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been documented, but we fear that the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is going to be lost. We need to document, we need to compile the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَأَمَرَهُ بِتَدْوِينِ السُنَّةِ وَهُوَ أَوَّلْ مَنْ دَوَنَ السُنَّةِ ibn Shihab al-Zuhri. He says, O oh, Zuhri, Compile the hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the book. And the very first person in Islamic history to compile the sunnah hadiths of the Prophet alayhi wa sallam is this man, Imam al-Zuhri, with the command of Umar ibn Abd al-Aziz, rahimahullah. So, Yuhan ifillah, he spread justice upon the earth. Then the year 101 of the Hijri calendar came. Then he started feeling sick. And he calls the doctors. The doctors tell him, ah, indeed, you have been poisoned. They investigate who's poisoned him. They find one of the slaves, says, come here. What, why have you done this? He says, your family, your relatives are the ones who paid me 1,000 dir- dinar and they from- promised me my freedom for me to poison you. And I did so. He says, okay. They gave you the money, bring that money. He says, take the money, put it in the treasury. I have forgiven you. No one should harm this young boy. You're free for the sake of Allah. Go live your life. And he died, Yuhanifillah, after ruling two years and a few months, the same time period that Abu Bakr as Siddiq ruled upon the Muslims. He died in the year 101 of the Hijri calendar. The scholars they say that the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, he says that every 100 years Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends someone to revive the faith, Al Mujaddid, someone who will bring forgotten practices of Islam to the Muslims. And they all agree that the very first mujaddid, the very first reviver of the Muslims in the first century is this man, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Later on comes Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmed, and so on and so forth. But they agree the very first person who deserves this attribute of al-mujaddid is this man, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, rahimahullah, he says, 
ليس أحد من التابعين حج حجة في أقواله إلا هذا رجل عمر بن عبد العزيز. There's none from the tabi'een whose words are evidence except this man عمر بن عبد العزيز. The scholars they say that this man used to fear Allah subhanahu wa taala the likes of Hassan al Basri. He, they used to say he was in the same level of knowledge as Imam Muhammad ibn Shihab al-Zuhir rahimahullah. Khanifillah, this is the one of the greatest people in our history. We deserve to know him better. We deserve to, we should name our children after the likes of such a person, the great Khalif of the Muslims who ruled from the year 99 of the Hijri calendar to the year 101 of the Hijri calendar, the Imam Umar ibn Abdul Aziz ibn Marwan ibn al-Hakam ibn al-As ibn Umayya ibn Abd al-Shams ibn Abd al-Manaf radiyallahu wa rahimahullah wa akhir da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.